floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm a software engineer, um, although I, I tend to have uh, a passion for pretty much all things data. So anytime there is a question about uh, you know, some sort of analysis or how we can use data to, to you know, visualize, how we can visualize data to actually come up with a better idea of how to solve something, I tend to be the person like raising my hand and saying like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll work on that for you. So I tend to spend a lot of weekends actually doing extra work, it seems like. Um, but it works out great because I get to, you know, dabble a little bit in things like visualizing geographic data and I get to come here and give talks on things like that. So, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do before we actually you know, go through the talk is just to kind of give you some ideas for my reasons for this talk. As I mentioned, I'm a software engineer. I'm not necessarily a uh, geographic information, you know, it's like specialist or anything like that. So, uh, why did I actually want to give a talk on this? And you know, a lot of that came from some work that I was doing for a course on the side. And as I was working on that, of course, I already knew you know, maps, maps are quite beautiful, maps are quite intuitive. Um, just about everybody you know can take a look at a map and you know, see some data on there, and they instantly have some idea of what, what message you're trying to convey, which of course makes maps extremely powerful. But I think the other thing that I, I didn't realize whenever I started looking into this was just how complex maps are and how much work it takes to actually create good maps. And um, that actually made me want to give this talk and hopefully share with you some of the things that I found that I found were fascinating, maybe a little geeky, um, hopefully not too geeky at times or whatever. And you know, hopefully the majority of you in here are not GIS uh, specialists as well and you'll actually get something out of this. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at the overview. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the power of maps. Uh, I want to—I basically have a little anecdote that I want to tell and just kind of give you some idea of just how useful maps can be. Um, then we're going to go into the main problem of maps. And this is the thing that kind of fascinated me. And there's probably quite a few of you in this room that already know this, but it's one of those moments in time whenever I, I, I never really thought about it very much, but whenever I, I got it, it was just kind of, huh. I wanted to tell everybody about it. So it's one of the reasons for doing this talk. So we'll see the, you know, what I'm talking about here in a little bit when we get to the problem of maps. Uh, next we'll go into how maps are made. Well actually, uh, you know, since we're talking about the problem and we want to see the actual, like, I guess how the sausage is made, the underlying uh, bits and pieces that actually come together to make this complex thing come about. Following that, we'll actually go into a few tips and everything on how to create good maps. And then finally, I have a few examples for you that I've put together um, in Python using mainly Basemap, which is a toolkit for uh, Matplotlib. And I have at least one example where I'm, I'm reproducing one of those uh, using Folium, which is a Python uh, library to leaflet.js. So let's go ahead and take a look at the power of maps. So my story basically comes with the uh, cholera outbreak of 1854. So I think it was around 1831, 32, uh, color actually made its way into London and started to make its way across the city. And in 1854, it hit Soho with a huge impact. In a matter of days, uh, over 100 people had already perished from the disease. And by, before the end of this outbreak, I think it was something like 600, uh, 600 plus people, 616 people, I believe, died from cholera just in Soho alone. So basically, you know, the town needed a savior of some sort. And luckily, uh, a man stepped up named Jon Snow to actually take care of this. So actually not the correct Jon Snow. Um, this is the correct Jon Snow. And, and that is actually how real heroes look. <laughs> or at least real data heroes. So uh, probably not the abs that you would expect, but you know. Uh, so, Dr. John Snow, he's, he's a physician working in, working in Soho, and at the time it was thought that basically cholera was coming from uh, basically breathing in like the polluted air. That was, that was the, the main thought that everybody had, and that you, you weren't going to tell us any other, way, any other reason that this was actually taking place. So he had an idea, and basically what he did was he decided to use data to actually prove his point. And he took a look at the map, and he basically took all the different uh, locations where cholera had sprouted up, and he plotted them down on a map of Soho, essentially one of the very first dot density maps, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And what he found was that all of these incidences uh, kind of clustered around one area in particular, 
and that was a water pump on Broad Street. So he went to, he went to the higher ups in the, in the community or whatever with this data uh, and basically said, look, cholera isn't being spread through the air, it's being spread through the water. It's contaminated water and we need to shut this off. And because of this data visualization, you know, this happened. They actually took the handle off the pump and no one was allowed to drink from the water and in no time whatsoever, uh, cholera cleared up in Soho. So, maps save lives. They are extremely powerful. So with that, in, with that out of the way, a little anecdote for why I love maps so much, let's look at what are the problems with maps. Specifically, what is the problem with maps? And now, George Box, the statistician, had a famous quote, which I think is slightly apocryphal. I think it's a little more mixed up than this, but it goes along the lines of, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Well, so are maps. And I'm actually going to claim that one. <laughs> I'm sure someone else said it, but just let me have it. <laughs> um, so anyway, let's take a look as, at the world as we know it. So most of us, this is probably how we see the world or whatever, right? This is what you call the Mercator projection. And we'll learn a little bit later what a projection is. But basically, it's one way to look at the world on a flat two-dimensional surface. Um, the problem is that this map is incorrect. If you look up here in the upper left corner, it's actually a little bit to the slightly left of the center, you'll see Greenland. And notice that it's, uh, it's nearly the same size as Africa, I believe. <laughs> so the problem is Greenland is no Africa. Uh, on the left, you'll actually see the Mercator projection with Greenland overlaid over top of Africa. And on the right, you'll see how big it actually is in real life. So, and to, to drive the point home a little further, this is the true size of Africa with several of the countries that we know, United States, China, India, big ones, you know, laid over top of it. You can see just how huge Africa is. Um, now, the real world, and you know, this is just sort of the real world, um, is actually slightly different. If you notice, this one looks a little bit weird, and. This is a famous scene from West Wing, which I never actually saw the show, but um, it's a fantastic uh, bit. You know, it's like, and this is literally how I felt. It's like, huh, oh my God, you're telling me that this is all wrong. Um, but if you notice, there's these little, let me go back one. There are these, uh, these little round circles. And I'm going to totally butcher this pronunciation, but Tissot's indicatrices. <laughs> and I did a lot of work looking up all the pronunciations for everything before I came in. So hopefully this is halfway decent. Um, what these do is just kind of indicate to you the distortion that you're seeing on the map in that particular area. And what you should hopefully see is a nice round circle in most places, and you do see that a lot throughout the center of the map. The equator is obviously perfect, and then as you go out from there, it gets a little worse, but notice that this one doesn't nearly look as bad as the Mercator projection we had. It's only to when you get to the very extremes at the poles that you really see a lot of distortion in those, in each indicatrix, or indicatrix. <laughs> so, let me speed back where I am. Okay, so back to the Mercator projection. So again, you can see like the, now we're seeing it with the indicatrices, and you can see every time you go away just one step from that, uh, from the equator, you're actually seeing the thing get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's actually ballooning each of these things up the closer you get to the poles. So, that's the major problem, and we know it's a problem for every map because of this man. So Carl Friedrich Gauss, and this is the one that I don't know how to pronounce, he wrote up this Theorema Egregium. <laughs> a remarkable theorem, I can pronounce that one. And basically the main thing behind it was that, or at least one of the, the main things for us, was that the Earth just cannot be displayed on a, on a map without some distortion. And you can kind of picture that, you know, I think the, the main way that you do that is by picturing an orange, draw the, draw the world on top of that, fill that orange, and then try to lay it flat. And you'll notice that you get something like this, where the world just basically falls apart at different places. Um, even better, take a balloon, draw it on there, and pull it apart, and you'll see all these, all these continents towards the top and the bottom of the balloon start to stretch out. And you can see where this distortion comes from. And now, all of this comes from basically having to create a map projection. And you heard me mention that earlier, and a map projection essentially just is a mathematical equation or an algorithm for taking points on a 3D surface and putting it onto a 2D uh, planar surface. So 
I thought I'd go a little bit deeper into what are all the basic components of that because it gets even more complex once you get to that point. So this is basically a tail of two coordinate systems. So we already know that what we want essentially is a planar or Cartesian coordinate system. That's what we want our map to look like. And you can call that a projected coordinate system. But what we start from is a geographic coordinate system. So let's take a little closer look at what that is. And the geographic coordinate system is basically made up of a handful of things, um, one of which is an angular measurement. So in our case, it'll be degrees, so latitude, longitude. You need some sort of surface that you project those actual <laughs> angular measurements onto. So that'll be what we call a spheroid or an ellipsoid, and those two things are used interchangeably. And then this is the other part that kind of amazes me, is that you actually have to take that spheroid and figure out where you want to place it in relation to the rest of the Earth. You would just assume that you would put it in the center of the Earth, but that's not necessarily 100% true. So let's take a look at a cross-section of our uh, geographic coordinate, uh, coordinate system. And you can kind of see just how this gets simpler and simpler and simpler as we look at it. So we start off with a picture of the Earth, which is the terrain in green, and it's just bumpy and all over the place, right? And we want to simplify that. So we'll tend to take that down to uh, an ellipsoid, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a geoid, which is more or less a way of saying like, if there were no bits of land sticking out, if there was just gravity, where would the Earth be or whatever, right? So you end up with something that's much smoother and you're just calculating exactly where the edges of the Earth should be according to gravity. Um, another way of looking at that is the mean sea level. And then from there, you go down even further because even at that point, you know, the geoid is fairly irregular, so we want something even closer to, or even simpler to work with, so we go to a spheroid or an ellipsoid. And now we have our model that we're going to base everything on. Now we just need to figure out where the hell to put it. So you end up with this idea of both local or regional uh, datum, is what it's called, or geocentric datum. And the idea of a datum is basically twofold. You have the spheroid that we just mentioned, and then you have the position relative to the center of the Earth. Now, traditionally, you would basically put this thing kind of closer to your side of the country. I mean, if you're gonna draw up a map, you want it to be as close as possible. And if you notice down here at the bottom, it's this green well. So if I'm writing a map up there, that's where I wanna put it, right? Problem is, on the other side of the Earth, it doesn't look very good. So they move it to their side. And then you end up with two maps that when you try to put them together, they just do not fit. So you get to today's day and age and we have GPS and everybody wants to be able to go everywhere and know where everything is. So now we have to have something called a geocentric data. So we actually have to position it on the center of the earth. And that is what uh, you, see, you see over here on the right. So now you have the first piece of the puzzle, right? You have basically where the 3D coordinates come from and now you need to put it and turn, in the, turn those things into the 2D coordinates. And you do that using map projections, which we mentioned. And there are three basic types of map projections. Cylindrical, conical, and <laughs> azimuthal. <laughs> um, so, and, and each of these makes you know, very intuitive sense whenever you look at it, right? So I'll just go over like one or, one or so. Uh, so the cylindrical one, imagine a piece of paper that you've just wrapped around the earth. You stick a, a light bulb right in the center and turn it on, and it just projects onto that. And if it stayed there, you know, think like a photo paper or whatever, right? You just cut it open and pull it open, and there's your map. Same thing with conical and zimuthal. Uh, think of it as just projecting. Now, one of the things that you'll hear people talk about is tangent versus secant. Um, so up here you'll see where each of these surfaces touch the earth, whatever, right? So that is your tangent line. And of course, that's where you have no distortion whatsoever. You can also have a secant line where imagine that you take that cylinder and you just keep constricting it further and further until it cuts through the center of the earth. Now you have two spots on the earth where no distortion exists or whatever. So there's different reasons for doing all of this and uh, tons of different reasons for actually choosing one or the other versus secant versus tangent and everything. And these are all the things that we're gonna use whenever we put together our examples later, later um, using base map. So that's the whole situation, right? The problem taking it from the 3D to the 2D. And I think this is actually one of the things that really interested me here. Whenever I looked at it, I was just you know, blown away. I was like, man, I had no idea whenever I sit down. And I, I mean, the hardest thing to me typically in the past, and there's quite a few, that, a few of you that might not actually realize this, was just folding the map back together. So, now luckily I don't have to do that part anymore, but still, maps, extremely complex. So 
given that there's all these trade-offs that you have to make when actually choosing a map projection, um, when you're looking at designing a good map, one of the very first questions, of course, then would be, which map projection do you choose? And, of course, there, there's going to be three main things that all of these map projections decide to make trade-offs on. First, angle. So you can think of it as, you know, basically the angle from one continent to another or whatever, right? So uh, you want to keep that as, as, as stable as possible if you're trying to plan out trips. Um, area, we already saw one example where area is being highly distorted, and that's the Mercator projection. And then finally, distance. So let's take a look at each one of these things, uh, each one of these map projections making trade-offs in each of these areas. So first is conformal or angular, and Mercator is an actual example of that. The reason this map was created, now remember I said all maps are wrong, but some of them are actually useful, and this one actually has a really good purpose. It was originally made for uh, sailors navigating at sea. The nice thing about having something where the angles are all correct is basically I can sit down and I can draw a straight line from one place to another, and I get a constant bearing at sea or whatever, right, in my, in my vessel. So it makes it very easy for me to navigate from one place to another. Of course, that's at the expense of Greenland looking like a giant, but you know, you got to make a trade-off somewhere, right? The other one that we saw is an equal area map. So obviously this is going to be important. Imagine that you're surveying land and you want to actually uh, figure out how big the, the spot's going to be for a building that you're going to put in. Now, if you went with the last one and you're building in Greenland, there's a good chance that you're not going to have enough room for your building. So you want to make sure that you've chosen the right map for the right job. And equidistant, of course, just means like now I can measure one point to another and make sure that I have the, the right measurement and it's not stretched out like crazy. Now, my favorite, I have to say, out of all of these is the Robinson projection. And the thing I liked about it was you know, the guy who came up with this, uh, Arthur H. Robinson, he basically looked at it from the point of view of let's make this thing just look good and convey information. So he kind of went backwards. What he said was, you know, I started off with something that I wanted, and then I actually figured out the math for it. Most, uh, most cartographers go the other way around, right? So the thing that I like about this is from our point of view, I, you know, there, there are two different types of maps. There's a reference map and there's a thematic map. I'm not creating reference maps. I don't really care as much about things being, you know, as accurate as possible. But what I do want to do is convey data in the best possible way. So Robinson, that's basically what he was trying to do, and that's why his map appeals to me so much. And just for a little side note, XKCD actually has this comic, so go check it out afterwards. It actually goes on for a lot longer. But it's basically what your favorite map projection says about you. Incidentally, mine says I like coffee and beetles, and it's spot on. So. <laughs> So, choosing the right map. So now we've got, we've, let's see, we've come from our journey from figuring out how to create a map and everything and what map projections to use, but now we need to figure out what kind of thematic map that we want to actually use to show our data. And examples of that are core plus, dot density maps, uh, proportional slash graduated, and cartograms. So let's look at each one of these one after another. So here's an example of a core plus, and what that does is basically show uh, data based on error, uh, area. Sorry. Dot density maps, we saw one earlier, that is the John Snow example. And we'll actually see how to create both of these. That's why I'm kind of skimming past them really quickly um, here in just a little bit. A proportional slash graduated symbol map. So this is one where it's actually symbol, uh, similar to the core plus map, but the nice thing about this is that you could actually change, say, the size of the symbol inside based on uh, based on the data that it's representing. And the nice thing there is if you think of an electoral map, all of us have seen them, uh, half the time it looks like the, well actually more than half the time, it looks like the, de the Democrats have no chance of ever winning or at least tied at best or whatever, right? And that's because the majority of the votes come from these really small states or whatever, right? So like uh, you get up to Vermont and all those kind of places, or Delaware I think or whatever, right? I mean some of these have like insane amounts of, of electoral uh, votes or whatever, but they have no land mass. So, you know, the nice thing about this is that you can kind of get past that and it allows you to show it in a different way. Same with cartograms. So here is a modern day version of a electoral map, uh, basically distorting the land mass as much as possible to try and give you a better idea of exactly how many votes you may have. So once you've chosen your map, one of the next things you may want to do is figure out how to standardize your data. You may want to classify your data. Um, and there are a few different ways. Here's just three of the ways that, that I've found or whatever that I thought I'd write up real quick. Uh, equal intervals, easy enough. Basically, you just pick a bunch of classes based on the number of, uh, the, the range in between. So like 1 to 10, 11 to 20, so on. Quantiles. 
Here we want classes where we want the same number of observations in each class. Natural breaks is uh, exactly what it sounds like. You're actually looking for areas in the data where it seems like there is a nice natural break between one class and another. And all these have advantages and disadvantages. Equal intervals, imagine that you have extreme outliers. Um, then what you end up with is like one or two classes with a bunch of data in it and then something way out there with you know, nothing in between or whatever, right? Um, let's see, natural breaks. <laughs> All right, I'm thinking we'll have to skip it, skim through a little bit faster. So anyway, uh, some of the classification methods that I just mentioned here, and these are histograms of the actual data, and this is one of the recommended ways of figuring out how to classify your data. Take a look at the histogram. And uh, a lot of things, a lot of times what you'll see is cartographers will start off with a natural breaks approach. There's an algorithm called Jenks, which is essentially just k-means for like a univariate data or whatever. Um, apply that first, see what you get, take a look at the histogram, and then you know, kind of uh, fiddle with it a little bit. That's recommended. So don't shy away from looking at your data and trying to do something by hand and not necessarily algorithmic every time. Uh, another thing that you might want to do is choosing the right colors, right? So sequential data, uh, you know, ordinal data and everything, you want to choose some sort of a, a color line where basically you end up with lightness being the main thing that you're differentiating on, right? That seems pretty, pretty fairly obvious. Um, divergent, though, you may want to choose like two different colors where lightness starts to differentiate in magnitude. And then qualitative, uh, you'll want to have different groups rep represented by all kinds of different colors. You want to make sure that you choose the colors in a way that it doesn't look like these could be, you know, in any way, shape, or form uh, sequential or whatever, right? So it becomes really important to choose the right color. And without going into a lot of theory, what I'm going to recommend is that you just go to Color Brewer. Um, Cynthia Brewer is like one of probably the most popular cartographers in the world. Uh, she has, you know, a few fantastic books and everything. I suggest, you know, checking them out. <laughs> and uh, Color Brewer in particular is where you want to, you want to look, and, and this is her own, like, uh, product. So. And I think I'm running out of time, so let's go ahead. Okay, so quick, quick, uh, one more story to kind of show you the, the importance of choosing the right things. So this is a, a, an article that was in the data blog from Washington Post, Chris Ingraham, whatever, fantastic blogger. And he basically pointed out that Pew Research went through and they looked at population growth, right? And they created this map. And they made all kinds of problems. Uh, the, the, two, the two which are the biggest ones are, they basically chose to classify their data incorrectly uh, there was, I think, something like 3,138 uh, 3, different counties that, sh that are in the thing, or sorry, 3,141, and out of those, 3,138 actually show up in like one or two of the classes. So basically, there's three counties in all the rest of the classes or whatever, right? So this is just a horrible, and you can kind of see it, right? You can see like this one thing that's actually up there, like kind of, you know, far off or whatever, right? So he redesigned it, and what he did was he classified the data correctly, but then he also chose a different color scheme because what you have here is a divergent set of data, right? You have people who, uh, places where the population actually went down versus places where the population went up. So he chose two different colors to represent that, and you end up with a totally different story here, right? Uh, you can actually see now that, you know, through the southeast, down around the Appalachian areas and everything, you know, population went down, whereas out here in the west, it actually started to go up in California and everything, which is kind of what you expect. So, all right, I actually made it through as much as I can. So I want to show you at least one or two examples before we, be, we leave. And these are all from a class that I put together for O'Reilly, um, Matplotlib for developers. If anybody's interested, uh, hit me up afterwards. I got like a 50% discount if you want to check it out. All of the, all the code, all, everything that you see here is all on GitHub. So I'll put this up so you can actually get it. So actually you could just read through the whole entire thing. Pretty much all the scripts for the course are there, so it's kind of free already. <laughs> so let's look at at least one or two of these before I run out of all my time. So introduction to base map. So base map, by the way, is, uh, as I mentioned, is the tool. Sorry. Oh, shoot. Whoops. Mm -hmm. uh, displays. All right, mirrored. Sweet. All right, so as I mentioned, base map is the toolkit for Matplotlib. So I'm going to skip past some of this stuff. This is just basically like uh, pulling everything in. I'm going to go straight down to 
Uh, notice here you can actually say, you know, base map dot supported projections. You get a list of every projection that you could possibly want to choose from. Uh, we're going to do the Robinson projection as our example, since I said that's my favorite. And you want to create a base map, specify its projection. And then for Robinson, it's really easy because basically it's showing the entire Earth. So you just want to give it a center location. So in this case, I'm giving it the prime meridian. And uh, draw map boundaries, coastlines, fill continents, uh, draw countries. A graticule, by the way, if you, if you haven't heard the term, whatever, it's just basically the, the network that all of the latitude and longitude make on a map. And eventually, you get down to something that looks like this. I'm kind of skimming through this because I want to show you at least one more, but it's a little, little bit more interesting. Uh, mainly because I want to show you creating a, a, another map that has a little bit more to it. So if we come down here, this is the core plot. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Is that better? More? <laughs> All right, so here's a little bit of a different one. I, I'm basically, I'm, I'm creating a Lambert conformal con, uh, like conic projection. So it's the, the cone version that we saw or earlier. It's conformal, so it's, its angles are all correct. And notice here that I actually have to specify boundaries for the whole entire thing. Now, since I'm only showing a portion of the map or whatever, you have to specify which portion you want to show. This is why it becomes really important to choose the right projection because if you choose the wrong one and you're showing a portion of the Earth where you know it's just distorted as hell, then you're basically showing your person, you know, your your audience, like just the worst possible uh, representation of data you can possibly come up with. So choose the right projection. Uh, one of the nice things, you go into Google Maps, you just right click on any point and you get the actual Latin long and that allows you to choose the lower left corner and the upper right corner and just pop them in here. Uh, your projection chosen and then notice down here you have lat and long and remember I said a line could be either tangent or secant. This is a case where it's actually secant I'm cutting through the earth. All right. <laughs> and I only have five minutes left so I'm going to have to cut it off early. Um, but again, uh, you know, it's like if, you, if you're interested in these, all, every last one of these are online. Eventually what you end up with is a nice uh, set of core plus. This is basically showing the unemployment rates uh, during the Great Recession. So I start off with 2006. Uh, year before the Great Recession, 2009, you can actually see a lot of uh, unemployment, say up in uh, Michigan where, you know, industries, you know, taking a big hit down the southeast and on the west coast. And that's the peak of the uh, unemployment, or sorry, the Great Recession. And then finally in 2014 when we've gotten back to normal. And there's a little bit, a little bit picture, a little bit bigger picture of it. And uh, I guess to show you just one other like idea of what you can do with it, uh, I go through and I pull down all of the San Francisco crime data, and I map that out in a dot density map using uh, the ArcGIS service. So I'm actually pulling down uh, raster images at this point in time, as opposed to just showing vectorized forms. All right, so uh, I had to rush through you know a little bit of that because I wanted to give at least a minute or two to see if anybody has any questions. So I'll just go ahead and cut it off right there. So, any questions? <laughs> questions? Yep. Over here. Sorry, can you go back to that code and explain what the secant line was? I, I wouldn't know what, where to go get that number. Yep, yep. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, let's see. Which one was it? Right. Uh, actually, a lot of a lot of these. So, a lot of these are just kind of guessing for me or whatever, right? Like what I'll do. So you can you can actually take a look at the map. You know, if you go to Google Maps and everything and click on it, you can see where the latitude and longitude lines are. And depending on what I want to show, like, so I'm just, I just want to show the actual United States of America. So what I did, I think, is I chose a Latin long that cut one above it, one below it and everything. So I think I actually put it a little bit, you know, down. So I have as much distortion as possible above and below. And I guess it's, uh, a, let me pull up the United States map again. So I think what I did, if I remember correctly, trying to find one that reduces the distortion as much as possible. And actually with some of these, honestly you can just find ones where they recommend a secant, you know, Latin long for you. 
Okay, so basically the first four numbers were the corners of your bounding boxes, yeah. your, your single bounding box, and then the other two numbers were two lines that were parallels? Yeah, okay. yeah and they call it the, uh, the standard parallel, the place okay. where there's just no distortion whatsoever. Exactly. In the crime map, uh, how, did you, how did you convert the natural language terms into longitude and latitude? Uh, it is crime from news articles? Oh, no, no, no. There's a, uh, yeah, right here. There, there's actually like a, a SFPD website you can go to and download everything in JSON and everything. So it's like fantastic. And you get the latitude and longitude. And the nice thing about your base map object is that it actually itself acts as a, um, it's a function you can call or whatever, right? And it is a map projection. There it is. So you pass in, here I'm gathering the Latin long, you pass that in, and it'll pass back to you arrays of X and Y coordinates, so. Okay, so it's, ma it's matching those somehow? Uh, Terms, two locations? Well, yeah, since, uh, so right. like I said, each one of those, which each one of those crime locations or whatever has a Latin long that I download from the SFPD oh, side. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. All right. Thank you.